LBC. From Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. I'm in charge. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Cross Question. Mary Cray's already being a little bit naughty. Uh, she is part of our panel, former Shadow Cabinet Minister, former Labour MP. Matt Warman is here, current Conservative MP for Boston and Skegness, former Culture Minister. Uh, Tim Stanley is historian and columnist for the Daily Telegraph. His book is called Whatever Happened to Tradition. And he, he's making a big speech tomorrow, which we might find out a little bit about uh, a little bit later. And Polly McKenzie is here, who's got the... Well, I called it a word which I can't say on air earlier, but the most um, ridiculous job title I think I've ever heard, Chief Social Purpose Officer at the University of the Arts London, yes. and uh, it was very important, and yes. former Director of Policy for Nick Clegg when he was Deputy Prime Minister, those halcyon days That's that we all silly remember title rather, one, <laughs> rather fondly. <laughs> As you can see, we've got a troublesome panel for you tonight. We've got lots of calls coming in, only one space free on the board. If you want to take part in our conversation, you can text 84850, say Alexa to send a comment to LBC or you can phone 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And we are available for you to watch on Global Player as well. Let's go to our first caller. It's David in Enfield. Hello, David. Good evening, everybody. My question is as follows. Does the rise of the new Conservative National Organisation, supported by leading Boris Johnson sycophants, including Lord Credas, mean the end of the road for Rishi Sunak? Well, there's two of them, aren't there? There's the Conservative De De Democratic Organisation, the CDO, and this other one, which rejoices under the name of National Conservatism. Um, if ever there was a more inappropriate title for a new political movement, I don't know what it would be. But Tim Stanley is speaking to their conference tomorrow, aren't you, Tim? I am. I, so I, let's I, start I, with you. Tell me, what is wrong with calling something National well, Conservatism? National Socialism, National Conservatism. You don't see a problem with that at all. It just conjures up images which I think any political movement wouldn't want to conjure up. Okay, maybe. Okay, fine. I, I don't see it myself. It, it, there are two movements that uh, the caller is, is sort of conflating into one here. One is a grassroots organisation which launched in Bournemouth over the weekend. And the goal of that is essentially to give uh, grassroots Tories more control over policy in the direction of the party. And it's become a platform for angry Boris. Sites. Yeah. Uh, the other one, the National Conservatism, uh, is far more academic and esoteric. Uh, it's based upon a book by an Israeli scholar, so the National Socialism link I don't see at all, uh, called Yoram Hosani, whose argument is that conservatism is essentially the preservation of cultural tradition. Um, and so that, hence, national conservatism. The idea is that from each country, conservatism will look different from one to the next. It's really a revival of Burkean. There's nothing scary about it at all. Uh, it's been popular in America. It's been brought to the UK. And in the UK, this conference has, slightly to people's surprise, become a platform for the social conservatives and cultural conservatives to lay out their stool. So what's interesting... So that's Suella Braveman gave a big speech there yeah. today. So what's interesting is that, bearing in mind the conservatives are still in office... They haven't lost a general election yet. And they still have a leader, Rishi Sunak, who's probably actually more popular than the party. It's intriguing to note that various factions are presenting themselves as future leaders before one is actually necessary. Um, and they're all trying to, if you like, buy an off-the-shelf philosophy. That's one way I look at it. There's a group of people behind Suella who are very intellectual conservatives like Miriam Cates and Danny uh, Kruger. And they're, they're sort of on board with the National Conservatism Project. I don't know how much Suella signed up to it, but it's about getting oven ready for when the Tories lose that you'll have not only some people behind you, but some ideas behind you. Polly. I, well, I mean, Tim's on to the most important point, really, is that the intellectual momentum of the Conservative Party has sort of gone out of governing and gone into positioning for opposition. Yeah. I think that's, that's just really sad. Uh, you know, we probably have another 18 months to go uh, of this government. I uh, went to the uh, the think tank onwards fifth birthday party um, last week, before I, I lose track, um, all these birthday parties, they blow into one, um, uh, talking to, you know, lots of Rishi Sunak staff there, and they were still talking about wanting to win. Uh, they might be wrong, but there was ambition there at least. A and it feels like, nevertheless, the Conservative Party's not, not managing to hold together. I, I saw one of the Conservative MPs who was at the Conservative Democratic Organisation uh, event talking about how she looked around her colleagues and looked like some of them ought to belong in the Lib Dems. And it's the sort of factionalism that 
actually you more expect on the left, you know, having, having is this you constantly new, find. Though, because all political parties have of factions. Course. I mean, you had the Orange Bookers in the Lib Dems against the more sort of social Democrats, didn't you? And but certainly. It, it's not yes, new this. Of course, of course, you always have people debating ideas in politics. Of course. But certainly my experience, having been in a party uh, of the Lib Dems sort of broadly of the left, is that the Labour people would always tell you, you don't belong with us, you're nasty, uh, we don't like you. And Conservatives would always be saying, you should They'd really join. they themselves by yeah. saying that. But yeah. the, the Conservatives would always try and say, you're really just a Conservative. I've endless yes. number of people who say, oh, but if you think this about markets, or if you think that about the... And, and that has always, you know, 20 years working around in Westminster, I have been encouraged to join the Conservative Party hundreds of times, never been encouraged to join the Labour Party because, you have because so of the sort resisted of temptation. psychopathic purism. I don't, I'm not a member of any pol political party. And, Are you and not? No, not at all. Um, Why? Well, because like you, Ian, I'm just more interested in kind of taking an independent view of things. Um, I also, when I left... It's not to be recommended for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I helped to set up the Women's Equality Party, uh, which slightly disqualified me from being a member of the Lib Dems anymore. Pre presumably you left the Lib Dems, That woman. Some point. Well, I just didn't review it. Mm. I mean, renew... Why, why, why? Well, I set up the Women's Equality Party. I, so I left government, mm. and that was the first thing I did, was set up a competitive political party. It felt sort of mildly disqualifying. I think technical breach of the constitution. Technical breach. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I have better things to do with my twenty-five pounds a year. But I also, you know, I'm just I'm fundamentally more interested in policy and policy making. Uh, and there are great minds in all the political parties, and also weirdo partisan people who you can't talk to about anything sensible in all the political parties. Matt. So I, th I think, look, as you just said to Polly, there have always been sort of vibrant political conversations uh, from different bits of all of the big parties and, and indeed from, from the Lib Dems, who, who have uh, been uh, always been a smaller party. So, so we shouldn't be surprised about that. The fact that we're talking about it on the day that there, have been, uh, there has been a, a conference shouldn't be a, a surprise. I think uh, what you are hearing is a plurality of ideas. That, that is to be welcomed. Very few of them represent government policy, actually, um, and the direction uh, that Rishi Sunak is taking is is, is twofold. One is to demonstrate uh, that he is on top of the issues that matter uh, at the top of most people's agenda. Those are primarily economic right now. Um, but, of course, it, we're all engaged in those conversations. We'll continue to be engaged in those conversations. It's interesting to hear what people think from a different wing of the party to, to, to that which uh, I'm on, and it will inform the debate. Debate, but just, I don't just tell us which wing you're on. I, I don't, well, so, so, so I, I, I would very much be uh, on, on what is sort of in the bubble speak called the One Nation end of the party, um, whatever you might want to define that as. But I don't think that sets me so far apart that I don't think of myself as fundamentally a part of the same party as Danny Kruger, Suella Braverman, and Miriam Cates. We're all of the same church. And that is part of the vibrancy of political debate. And I think what what completely rebuffs what Polly and Tim have just said is to see, you can't say there is a vibrancy of political debate that proves that the Conservative Party has no ideas. Quite the opposite. This is a demonstration of a party that is uh, in government, still talking about interesting things, still debating Debating what the future uh, in the Matt, longer the term looks like. the Home Secretary said she doesn't like the government's immigration policy. Like that's, I mean, that, how is that compatible with kind of collective well, I'm cabinet not, I'm, responsibility? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's quite uh, a, a fair thing. I was, I, I, I was talking to her uh, literally half an hour ago. She certainly didn't uh, say that she disagreed with her own policy then. So I, I think it's very easy to take sort of 15 words out of one speech uh, and say, well, look, this demonstrates some grand narrative. Of course it doesn't. What it demonstrates is that people have uh, different perspectives. They want to get things done. The Conservative Party wants to deliver the very best it can for the country between now and the general election and, of course, after the general election, uh, aiming for a future term in government. None of this is surprising. It's nice to be talking about it mid-term, uh, but in practice, this just demonstrates a plurality of ideas that's there in every party and will continue to be there. Mary, doesn't this demonstrate that all political parties are effectively coalitions? That the Labour Party has people on the hard left through to the Blairite 
right, if I can put it that you, you would. I certainly think there's fewer people on the hard left um, in well, the Labour Party there are, there are um, now. Than, than there were. But if, you, if you're going to win an election, whether it's the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, you've got to widen that electoral coalition, haven't you? You do. And, and that's been the case. I, mean, I, I think back to the Thatcher years where you had the Tory reform group on the left of the party and, and well, Conservative Way Forward was formed after she left, but there, there were groups then. This is nothing new, is it? Well, what's new is that we have two new grassroots Conservative organisations sort of being born in the space of, of a weekend post the local election results, which were a historic low for the Conservatives. And uh, what I think, uh, as Polly has said, is the spectacle of a Home Secretary standing up and berating her own government's immigration policy when she's in charge of immigration and has, and has overseen a catastrophic backlog um, in asylum cases, 100,000 uh, asylum cases. Sort of, you know, front page of the papers this morning saying Britons, you know, will forget how to work with all this reliant on cheap labour. People haven't forgotten how to work. People are working hard, but they're working hard for their poverty. And they're finding it harder to make ends meet. They're finding it harder to pay their rent. They're finding it impossible to pay for childcare, which is now running at a, a, about £1,000 a month. Question. So to David's question, is this the end for Sunak? No, it's not the end, but it's a bit of a reverse firework for him. He does not want this going on when he's trying to look statesmanlike, meet with Zelensky, etc. And having Jacob Rees-Mogg up there criticising voter ID and saying we did this gerrymandering thing and then we, it turns out there were loads of older people that didn't bring their ID and they were going to vote Conservative. You know, criticising very, very recent government policy is not helpful to a leader. Um, does Yes, this is undoubtedly Suella's bid for the leadership um, but the fact that she is doing this at this stage with 18 months, a year at least, left to run of this government means that this is, I, for me, it's a party that is out of ideas. And I'm always nervous when you have a think tank that is funded by the US right, the sort of populist US right, which is what this Edmund Burke Foundation is. It's another shadowy think tank. We're not quite sure where the money comes from. And they're over here, you know, trying to do, um, you know, kitchen baby. You know, we need more babies, according to Miriam Cates, but then we need fewer people, according to Sue so who's right? Well, she is practising what she preaches, I think, because I think she has recently had a baby, hasn't she? So, <laughs> so. I'm pro-baby, just A politician who delivers. Mm. Ba but I'm there's nothing wrong with babies. No. I'm I, think babies can, I think we can all agree on that. I'm, I'm pro-baby, although I don't have one. Neither does the Pope, by the way. But he's well, you do very, have a dog. He's a very Christian bird. You have a dog. But if I may just say one thing that I find interesting, which I, I really like about this conference and this group of people, is they're asking, they're, they're conservatives are starting to ask themselves, can people actually afford to live in a conservative way. So if the conservative ideal is family plus babies, have we actually had the economic policies that make it possible for people to live like that? And what they're discovering after 13 years of being in government, 14 or whatever, and they should have discovered this sooner, is they discover that actually the kind of uh, economics they've practiced, the kind of uh, warmed up Thatcherism they've been operating, actually makes it very hard for people to live like good conservatives. They can't get a house, they can't get childcare, the education's rubbish. There's a competition over services. That's where a lot of their complaint about immigration comes from, is that being unable to see a GP or being able to get on the housing, uh, being able to get a house. So that's what I think is, from someone who is more sort of culturally conservative, but on economics a little more social democratic, I'm excited to see conservatives move towards me and say, how do we actually create the conditions under which people can live the way we've been telling them for years they ought to be living? But so, your so, government, the government, the Tory... It's in my Tory, government. Well, the Conservative, <laughs> the Conservative government, along with the Liberal Democrats, imposed a two-child limit on universal credit. Thank that you, has yes. thrust, and that was... And uh, that has thrust yes. over a million children yes. into poverty. Yes. So we have, as a, we have people working in poverty. He's agreeing we with you. Children, we have children. I'm furious about about this, all of the good work that was done under the last Labour government to lift pe yeah. mainly female pensioners and children out of poverty, which is, has lifetime scarring effects, yes. has been undone by this disastrous policy. And Danny Kruger said today that another thing was the hollowing out of local government. There exactly. are Conservative MPs Cops who are... And, and it, it is on them that they hadn't noticed for 13 years, but they are waking up to the social and cultural consequences of austerity. Exactly. Well, well, I, 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 I wouldn't dare make this a criticism of Tim, but I think there is danger in some of this. 
and some very lazy characterizations. What's the primary reason that you can't get an appointment with your GP that the NHS is stretched? It's because of an ageing population. What's the primary and reason? Enough training enough places, GP. Not enough no, 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 absolutely. And, and, and we can all criticise Labour for not expanding GP places in 2008. But ultimately... You've cut the training I've had 13 places. years. Massi- and, and since then, we have massively increased the number of training places no, of doctors. That there, is, there, is, there are fewer... The Matt, qu- there are fewer GPs now than there were in And there are more people working in general practice that will go on to become GPs because of the expansion under a Tory government. So there is a real danger of some very lazy characterisations that simply say 2 plus 2 equals 6. What I think we should be having is a sensible, more nuanced conversation that says, how do we address the challenges of getting people into productive work, for instance? Some of that has to be through the kind of childcare policies you've seen come from Jeremy Hunt recently. Some of it has to be the kind of expansion of medical schools that we've seen under this Conservative government. I think there is a real danger. We haven't cut places of medical schools, Mary, you know that. You've cut um, nurse the, training places, the, you've cut the nurse budget, you've 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 overseen well, again, it, you've gone to war with the NHS, and the they are leave, they leave, there's an exodus of NHS We, we may have a question on the NHS oh, okay. later. <laughs> I've got no Getting idea whether we will myself. or not, but you never know, somebody might like to phone in with so one. So David, it's not the end for Rishi Sunak. Okay, Sunak. David, thank you very much indeed thank for a great question there. to start us off. David is, actually no, he isn't still there, I might have gone, <laughs> I might have gone back to him if he had been. So we've got some really good question coming up from Robbie in Chelmsford, it's 17 minutes it's past eight. This is LBC. In a cry. Ask question with Ian Dale on LBC. You can do it in five minutes. 19 minutes past eight on LBC. Don't forget, if you miss an episode of Cross Question, you can catch up on the Cross Question podcast. There was one episode last week that got three times the normal amount of listeners, and none of us can work out why it was, <laughs> because that, there wasn't a celebrity on the panel. Sometimes that sort of, like, we had Thomas Skinner from The Apprentice on. He <laughs> always boosts the figures, but he wasn't on. So, anyway, uh, but you can get that on Global Player, of course. It's up about 11 o'clock every night. Right, uh, we have with us Mary Cray, Matt Warman... Polly McKenzie and Tim Stanley. Let's go to Robbie in Chelmsford for our next question. Hi, Robbie. Evening, all. Um, my question is, in the UK stage, do we have taxation without representation? Is that an allusion to this idea from Keir Starmer that EU citizens should be given the right to vote? 
and 16, 17-year-olds as and, well, yeah. OK. Well, let, let's bring bo- both of those into this. Um, Polly McKenzie, I think the Liberal Democrats, uh, which I know you're not affiliated with any longer, <laughs> um, I think they have a policy of votes for 16-year-olds, and I suspect they might well agree with Keir Starmer on votes for EU citizens. But... Um, The argument about no taxation without representation is a strong one, but also, traditionally, you've always had to be a citizen of most countries to be able to vote. Now, there are one or two exceptions to that, but that is how most EU countries operate, isn't it? So I'm probably going to upset lots of your uh, listeners by saying that personally I would actually start votes at birth. Um, Okay. uh, So David Runciman, the kind of Cambridge... I see a few practical problems with that. Yes, the Cambridge philosopher, he suggested that it'd be better to wait till they can hold a pencil at six, uh, which is probably reasonable, but um, I'd be happy, maybe Tim will support this, to give parents the proxy vote until the child is ready to hold a pencil. Are are, are you being serious? I'm literally being serious, and here's why. So at the moment, 20% of the population are under 18. That means you have a chronic failure to represent the needs of the future. And you might say children aren't capable and we can argue about 14-year-olds versus 17-year-olds, whatever. There is no capacity test for adults. You can have late-stage dementia. You can be drunk to a point of total uh, uh, unconsciousness and you can still exercise your vote. So we, we don't we'll be a have cabinet capacity. minister. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just think Fundamentally, you you need to find a way of representing under 18s in the electoral system. That may be best by allowing that vote to be held by parents potentially till 16, till 18. But you have to find a way well, to represent get the birth those rate people. up, wouldn't it? I suppose. Or yeah, I mean, lots in, of people find it way. very upsetting. They don't like the idea that you're sort of rewarding people who have children. I'm sure, Sola Braverman uh, would be think this is a fantastic. It's sort idea. of too too um, too too socially conservative. But for me, you have to find a way to represent the needs of under 18s. Otherwise, you will always have a set of priorities for the country that are distorted away from the future and towards the present. You also, you know, our population demographically is changing dramatically. The proportion of people who are uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic, or mixed race who are under 18 is far higher than the proportion of our population who are uh, over 65, who who are BAME. And I think we just have to find a way to, to enfranchise that part of the population. I'm much less radical when it comes to people who aren't citizens of the United Kingdom. I actually think we, we charge way too much for people to become citizens. Uh, when I was in government, we looked at this, and uh, Oliver Letwin and I tried to work on an initiative to, yes, uh, you know, think very carefully about what we charge for visas to come to the country, but actually to try and have a really open-hearted, warm and generous encouragement offer to help people become citizens. If you are, you know, if you've got your, your permanent indefinite leave to remain, it can still cost you and your family thousands and thousands of pounds to make that commitment to be British. I think we should we should try and build a much more kind of civic identity, a civic nationalism, a sense of deep pride to be British, lower the cost, absolutely hugely lower the cost to, you know, 50, 100 pounds or something to become a British citizen, I would be delighted for my taxes to subsidise that kind of okay. sense of belonging and identity. What, one of our more eloquent listeners says, what a load of absolute grollocks, or words, or words to that effect. Well, yeah, that's fine. Um, you can disagree with me. <laughs> Matt. I think in some ways it's quite straightforward. I think if you're a citizen, you should be able to vote, and I think if you're over 18, you should be able to vote. Those, those seemed fairly immovable to me. That's the current state. But quote. What, what I do think... That's not being controversial. What, what, I, do, what I do think, exactly. What I do think um, is that we should be open to a sensible conversation about the age of majority. So there are lots of there are lots of inconsistencies about when you can do various different things, when you can join the army. There used to be a relative inconsistency about when you get married, that, that sort of thing. I think if we're going to have a conversation about when you can vote, it should be part of a, a conversation that is much broader about personal responsibility and all of that. I I, I do hear what Polly is saying, of course I do, about uh, ch- about younger people and being represented within the political conversation. Um, but uh, I can I can say with 100% certainty that uh, the Conservative Party looks at the proportion of uh, relatively young people that vote Conservative and thinks, how do we appeal to that market more? Now, uh, that is that is uh, absolutely involves talking to uh, people across all those ages. It involves talking to people who uh, have a range of different views. I don't think that necessarily needs to go as far uh, as uh, sort of votes for, for six-year-olds. And as someone with a, with a six-year-old at home, she, she's lovely, but I don't think I would give her that pencil yet. Well, because you think she wouldn't vote for a dad. 
Mm-hmm. Not if she's got any sense. <laughs> Make my childcare cheaper, Daddy. Um, her, her childcare is currently free because it comes from Daddy most of the time. Uh, but uh, look, I, I, I do think there is there is a, there is a real conversation to be had about uh, what are all the political parties doing across the uh, different uh, age ranges. Of course, there is. You don't have to extend that into a conversation about voting, which I think quite quickly goes down rabbit holes around v- giving people age zero the vote. Mary? Uh, Well, I think this is Keir Starmer trying to restore a feeling of fairness in politics. And I think the principle... On the 16-year-olds or the EU citizens? On the EU citizens. So I think if you come here, you pay your taxes. I think if you come here, you pay taxes, you Mm. should have a say in how the nation is governed. why shouldn't a Brazilian have that right too? Well, that's a... Let's... Let's do it step by step, shall we? If we look well, at... Well, no, it's, fundament- it's fundamentally discriminatory. That's what it is. And we all know why, don't we, Mary? We, we have the franchise for people from Ireland mm. since 1921. So my, parent, mm. my dad was born in Ireland. He voted in the UK. He was not a British citizen. Um, people's parents who come here from the Commonwealth also have the vote. So, you know, Australia, Canada, uh, Indian subcontinent all have I, the vote. But I can so understand the argument your... for widening the franchise if you're going to give it to everybody who's got settled status. But to say it should only be for EU citizens seems to me um, discriminatory. It seems to me that it's done for one reason and one reason only, to basically widen the franchise to make a vote to rejoin the EU more easy. That's what the Conservative Party is going to accuse him of. I don't know if there's a master plan. I'm not party to those discussions. This is under discussion as part of the National Policy Forum. So if we go to the second part of the question, which is the votes at 16, I supported votes at 16 when I was um, an MP. And I did that because I found that when I spoke to the the sort of six formers, they were absolutely passionate about politics. They had great ideas. We had the youth parliament sitting in the House of Commons. Speeches were fantastic. They were campaigning on things like better bus services, um, safety for young women as they you know, we're going home um, at night, all of these really sensible um, policies. And I think something happens when kids go to uni or, you know, start work, which is it sort of, it goes onto the back burner. It's, you know, they're not registered in their halls of residence and they don't vote, etc. And I think that it goes a bit off the boil and becomes a bit haphazard. So I think if you get them when they're young and sort of sow the seed of, okay. of voting and thinking that's important. And just on the future generations, the Welsh um, Assembly has a future generations Act, which is all about looking at every aspect of policy and a future generations commissioner to say, does this, will this harm or help the next generation? And it also... Future generations commissioner. Yeah. To, to look, but it, what it's really also useful for is looking at a climate lens as well and saying, actually, what is this going to do around our net zero ambitions as well? So, you know, taking a longer term, independent view away from the day to day and the hurly burly of, um, you know, this this political party, whoever's in government at one time. Tim Stanley. Let's take the two issues separately. First on the question of age. I'm not sure it reflects well on the left that they think they can only win a general election if three-year-olds are given the vote. We um, do this. And we this they about, it's only me. And this is about... <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know. But, me and David okay. Wonson, okay. like, let's not, let's not tie the Labour Party with that brush. But I the, mean, the, le- the left does take a very instrumentalist approach towards <laughs> voting. Uh, whenever it loses an election, it looks at ways of uh, altering the outcome by changing the way in which people participate. So uh, Thatcher dominated, let's give devolution so Scotland can be self-governing. Well, the Tories have brought um, in voter hang, ID. Hang oh, yeah, yeah, I'm probably, probably I'm broadly against that too. And now Jacob regrets it. I'm not so. a Tory. Um, but so, and then the other, then you get proportional representation. Well, the Tories tend to dominate first possible, so which is PR. And then you get, then, then there's a sort of awareness that younger people, although the they don't necessarily come either. Hang, hang on, necessarily, young people don't necessarily come out to vote in large numbers, so I'm not quite sure what difference it would make. But there is this view that, okay, the younger people are, the more likely they are to vote uh, for the left, so we'll lower the age of voting as well. I personally uh, take a slightly different view, which is that uh, all our knowledge of science suggests that the age of maturity is much later and is growing. So if anything, I'd be inclined to push uh, voting back a bit. Uh, But I I see this purely as about the left uh, gambling, that this will win them more seats. And on the question of allowing people from outside to vote, well, this actually brings us back to national conservatism, because it's actually a debate about what is the nation state and what is the nature of citizenship. Uh, And there is a view that the taxation without representation view that we are all essentially uh, human beings, part of the same world. 
and you should you can just be automatically plugged into and part of the local democracy and a citizen of wherever it is you happen to live at any given time. Um, there is another view which I hew towards, which is more that belonging is something deeper than that. Uh, it requires a, a different kind of investment, and that the process we have right now of of becoming a citizen is something which uh, is, is correct. And that what and one of the ways in which we mark out borders and belonging is through the concept of citizenship and who gets to vote. Uh, and so I, I see a, a tussle of different philosophies here, but I think on balance that what we do right now is correct. Right. Well, um, I was going to ask you about compulsory voting as well, but we've run out of time. So yes or no answers. Compulsory voting, Tim. Of course not. No. Polly. No. Mary. No. No. That wouldn't have been a very interesting discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't. Right, uh, we're going to move on to a, a very different subject in a moment. 0345 6060973. You might want to ask about Vladimir Zelensky's visit to the UK today. Um, another four-day working week trial is coming with South Cambridgeshire District Council moving its bin lorry crew to four days. What could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> it's 8.31. News headlines with Tim Daly. Moscow says it takes an extremely negative view of Rishi Sunak's announcement the UK will give more weapons to Ukraine on the day of a visit to the UK by Volodymyr Zelensky. Britain will send new attack drones and more air defence missiles. An investigation has found supermarkets could be overcharging for fuel. The Competition and Markets Authority says it has evidence the current prices we pay at the pumps aren't entirely down to forces beyond retailers' control. And the Home Secretary has used a speech at the National Conservatism Conference to call for net migration to the UK to be reduced. So Ella Braverman's address has been seen by some as a warning shot to Rishi Sunak on immigration. LBC weather, dry overnight with clear skies, but thicker cloud and scattered showers will move in across northwest Scotland. An overnight low of three degrees. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 
nation, which is code for the Lib Dem Wet. Please let me do my job. 8.35 on LBC. We have with us the Lib Dem Wet Matt Warman. That's what he's been described as on Twitter, apparently, in response to his answers on this programme. But he is actually Conservative MP of Boston and Skegness. Uh, Mary Cray is chair of the Responsible Business Practice for the PR agency Lexington Communications. That must be more than a full-time job, Mary. It is. What do you actually do? Um, I advise, but I do. I, I chair the Ethical Trading Initiative. I'm on the board of London Transport Museum, and I do teach at Cranfield um, School of Management as well. So, but that would have been an even more ridiculous intro. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Um, Polly McKenzie is a Chief Social Purpose Officer at the University of the Arts London. What what does Social Purpose Officers? What does the social purpose? Well, there's only do? three in the world, right? So I'm trying to, I'm carving out a niche, but it's basically and you're the chief one. It says, here. yeah, it's yeah. a combination of chief sustainability officer, something that you know Mary works with in her practice, and uh, Prince Harry's job title, chief impact officer, thinking about how we make sure that our research impact as a university and the impact of our graduates is as as big as it can be in terms of helping the creative industries to thrive. I don't have to ask what Tim Stanley does because mm. I know he writes. I've just come back from Eurovision. Have you? I was covering it for the Telegraph. I got the. I got. See, the how gig. did you get that? Gig? You didn't enjoy it. Did you didn't. You should. I actually didn't asked. enjoy. Oh. It. No, he's very. <laughs> See, I, I would have failed to be Global's Eurovision correspondent. I had to sit through the grand final three times. Excellent. Because I had to watch the rehearsal in the arena, the rehearsal as done properly, and then the final as well to make sure it didn't contradict what I just said in the paper had happened. So I saw every gag that was spontaneous. I saw it being rehearsed. There was a lot of spontaneity. The, there was with the literally presenters. no spontaneity. Every time someone went, oh, I can't believe you just said that, that was rehearsed. Really? Yes. So Hannah Waddingham, <laughs> I, shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have been as impressed with her as I was. Oh, it was oh but rehearsed. isn't she fabulous? She, she is fabulous. The hair was amazing. She, the show was actually, very good. Eyebrows. Did you know anything about Eurovision? Before? Oh, yeah, no, I did. I, uh, I, I'm a, I, I am quite a fan, quite a buff on it, but I just thought the music standard was really low this year. It's just it club land dross. It just yeah. oomch, oomch, oomch. and I just I'm listening to that. Who knew time. that Tim Stanley can yeah. beatbox? Yeah. The first time, like, the first hour I spent in the rehearsal, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I felt so old because my bones were shaking. <laughs> and looking around, there were all these people not only enjoying it, but they knew the words. You and there were no words. To the 1994 Eurovision Song Contest in Dublin, which I right. went to, where I saw the first ever performance of river dance oh. Oh. amazing that and is life changing i watched it was it was it life changing amazing. Actually. i remember the it. whole audience watched it. it and even those of us who hate any form of dance we yes. were in tears it was Flatley. just so emotional yes yes it was a big deal anyway not bad for our team yeah sonia was robbed as well should we go to another quite oh, we don't want to talk about sonia, <laughs> sonia was robbed dear, oh dear. <laughs> Uh, let's go to another question before we degenerate even further. It's a text question from Daniel in Basingstoke. The EU is letting Microsoft buy the company which makes Call of Duty when the UK blocked the deal. Is this country anti-business? Now, the European Commission, the background to this is the European Commission has accepted Microsoft's £55 billion offer to buy Act Activision Blizzard. What a name. <laughs> But the deal must be accepted by the US, EU and UK. Um, Britain's Competition Commission blocked the deal last month and the US Federal Trade Commission has filed a lawsuit against it with a declaration decision on that not expected until next year. Um, so much for global Britain being open for business, Matt Warman. Oh, not at all. Uh, so so I'm, uh, I was certainly the first person to raise this acquisition in Parliament, um, and I think it's a really important principle uh, that uh, monopolies are bad for business, they're bad for competition. Now, I don't want to get, partly because it's still with um, our regulator to some extent, I don't want to get into the whys and wherefores of, of where this particular deal should end up. But the idea uh, that uh, it is simply a, a sign of a country being open for business to allow uh, one major corporation to buy another in a way that no one disputes would have major impact for consumers uh, as well as for business. Britain has got a great video games industry that should not uh, be jeopardised by these sorts of deals if that is what they were to do. So why has the EU allowed it? Well, so, so you've got differing opinions um, in the EU, in the US and the UK. Uh, fundamentally what this dispute is actually about is how important cloud gaming is going to be to the future uh, of gaming as a whole. Now, uh, I, I'm happy to talk about that for, for, for much longer, but your eyes tell me that you're uh, not. Uh, this, this is a really important issue for a really important sector. The creative sector is, is hugely important for UK PLC. 
I think the fact that one regulator takes a different view to a UK regulator. Uh, when we were in the EU, the EU would very often look to our regulators as genuinely world leading. Uh, I don't think we should give up that status and I don't think we have. Mary? The US regulator. Are you an expert on cloud gaming? Not at all, although um, I I have two people in my house who definitely are. I'm trying to to, um, train me um, at half term. It was embarrassing and sad and they laughed very hard. Um, But I did, you know, have a little go and to try and get down with the kids. What I think is that the UK and the US have blocked this and that tells you something I think... Well, the US hasn't yet. No, the US regulator has blocked it. That's what their their petition is for. Yeah. So So the EU has, has, has uh, allowed it, but on the basis that they license their software to allow other competitors to use it. So I think there's some important discussions here. People of our age, this doesn't, you know, we don't play these games. We don't really understand this industry. Perhaps others do. Matt clearly um, but, but also does. Lo- lots of older people do. I wouldn't characterize yeah. you as an older person, Not but lots, 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 lots of older people do. It, it, is a, it crosses huge numbers of Yeah, uh, the of principle barriers. is... Is the, is, monop- is the monopoly power of Microsoft and the crowding out of innovation. And I think it'll be interesting to see what the US regulator does on this as well and what the impact is on the UK's very important uh, gaming industry um, because it's, it's, an, it's a really important part of our cultural sector. Well, for somebody who admits that she's on the older side of this panel, can I say what a brilliant answer that Thank was? Because if, <laughs> if I'd had to give it, I would have been floundering. <laughs> Tim Stanley... <laughs> I'm, and I'm older I, than you. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what you're all talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, there's I, I. What kind of game is Call of Duty? I haven't. Um, a is it a game. shooting one? Yeah. Yes. Oh, see, I thought see? it meant Line of Duty. No. <laughs> oh no. Well, that that's is good. brilliant. They oh, I watched that. Down. No, I can talk about that all night. <laughs> but no, I'm afraid I don't. There's no point talking about that. Okay, I know Polly. What you're talking about. So I'm actually very aligned with Matt on this. I think, firstly, that it is not anti-business to be pro-competition. That's just a, a general truth. That, that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, it's a slam dunk that there should never be any international takeovers or collaborations, of course, but being thoughtful about promoting innovation and competition is absolutely essential for business, uh, for a good business environment over the long term. And the UK is unbelievably good at games. games. Yeah. Uh, it is, you know, you think back to the days of kind of cool Britannia where we were really leaning in as a country to the idea that soft power, creative industries were a really important part of how Britain kind of faced the world and how we grew our economy and how we created prosperity for people. Um, and, and sometimes it feels, you know, working in a creative arts institution that, that too many people in the Conservative Party are like, oh, we don't really like the creative industries because they're woke. That's that's crazy, actually, because uh, the creative industries are so important. It's not a very good impression of Matt, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Matt I, I was fooled. I was fooled. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's yeah. so important to our prosperity, to jobs. Um, you know, we we have a, a screen school at, at University of the Arts London, um, which includes, a, you know, a gaming school. We have a creative computing institute because this is the way that the creative industries are going, you know, blurring the boundaries between film or even fashion and, and gaming. So it's really fascinating the way, um, you know, one of the responses, and Mary knows a lot about fast fashion, having done investigations into that. One of the kind of futures around this is how can you create digital clothing experiences? People, kids spend huge amounts of money on outfits within games. How can you upgrade that to be an even more kind of rich fashion experience? A digital clothing experience. Yeah. People genuinely do. do. Much it's like Tim's experience with that jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You could no, create a real. virtual version of that. So we, Please God, no. We, so we're experimenting with this at UAL, creating virtual studios. There was an exhibition at the um, at the V&A of some of that kind of immersive technology where you can kind of like experience clothing. Instead of buying it for five quid off one of these online fashion retailers and chucking it in the bin, so single-use clothing, you basically buy it digitally for pennies, put it on, do your Instagram photo, and then there's been How no waste. How can you put it on? Well, you put it on your body and you can you can digitally manipulate it so you can you can wear it and post your photo because that's often what happens. Stuff is coming back mm-hmm. with, the, with the labels on. I just want to say one thing. In Wakefield, we had um, an AIM-listed company called Team 17 and they were responsible for a game called Worms. I didn't know 
know anything about them, but they are the only aim, you know, the only aim listed company in Wakefield, and you know, very very important part of our um, economy. What, what is fast fashion? Fast fashion is basically where um, companies. I did a big inquiry into this, so it's a long story, but basically companies. Um, pay very low wages to workers in uh, developing countries and bring it over here and sell it at rock bottom prices and it is treated almost as a single use item so it's being sold for less than the price of a cup of coffee, £2, £3 there is now a move to make it slower fashion to make consumers more thoughtful to make them um, think before they press uh, go and you you remember the kind of uh, scandal with Boohoo during the Covid crisis yeah. where their factories were continuing so you know locked fire doors um so um at ethical trading initiative this is one of the bulk of our work making sure those workers are protected i don't know about everyone listening but i feel i've learned a lot from the answers to that question particularly from tim <laughs> <laughs> now uh if you wish to digitally manipulate us you can do so for the next 15 minutes by saying alexa send a comment to lbc it's 8 45 lbc there it Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. 848. Polly McKenzie is hugely surprised that our digital team have <laughs> clipped her answer on babies <laughs> voting. <laughs> Do you do not understand sort of what it takes to go viral, Polly? Because uh, you're just about to do I'm that. I'm just. I'm wondering how long it will take for the first person to tell me. And that apparently, I'm I've been delivering fake news on my river dance anecdote. There, someone saying here um, that it was actually performed first in Mill Street, Cork. I don't doubt that, but it was right. the first tele. Yeah, televised. I don't think well, you're saying the, it was when it was invented. One I saw wasn't televised because it was actually the dress rehearsal. <laughs> right. Uh, Amazing. So. It was when it when it became. Anyway, a thing. 
honestly went, cut me down. Yeah. It went global. And then you couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> no. Uh, Matt Warman is here, Mary <laughs> Cray, Polly McKenzie uh, and Tim Stanley. Right, let's go to another question from Trisha. Actually, before we do, I'm going to give you, the audience, advance notice of our fun question at the end um, because I'd like to hear your suggestions as well on, on the text. Um, more speculation in the papers today about who will be the next James Bond. The latest room is Aaron Taylor-Johnson of Kickass fame. No, me neither. Uh, panel, can you pick the next 007? But, and this is the sting in the tail, it must be a public figure who you've actually met in person. So just bear in mind that last bit for everyone listening. You can text 84850, the next James Bond, but it must be a public figure who you've met in in person. Right, our next question is from Trisha in Lancaster. Zelensky came back to Britain earlier and was asking for fighter jets again. Should we still be saying no to him? Well, Britain, just a bit of background to this, Britain will be providing hundreds of air defence missiles and also armed drones to Ukraine, but Rishi Sunak says providing fighter jets is not a straightforward thing and that Britain will work with other countries which could supply F-16 jets to Ukraine. As far as I know, I think Poland is the only country that supplied a number of jets, um, but anyone, please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, one of the Baltics had, but Estonia, right. Lithuania, I thought. Okay. What's your view on this? Me? Yeah. Well, he was here in, um, whenever it was, January, um, and begging, you know, give us wings so that we can protect our freedom. Um, I think there's a mismatch here because what he wants is F-16s, which are the US-made jets. We make our own sort of typhoons. Right. And um, so there's a, you know, he wants a unified, he wants one plane that they can train people and, it, and it's the older generation plane because that's the one that people are decommissioning. Um, there's been a reluctance to do this. I think people's, uh, the general reluctance from the European capitals is we have to get behind him. And the longer we force him to go around with a begging bowl asking us for material to control the skies, the longer this conflict is going to drag out. And I think there has been a huge movement in European capitals that thought that, you know, Putin was going to walk into Kyiv, um, you know, in 10 days. The heroism of the Ukrainian people, the incredible leadership and sacrifice of Zelensky and, and the Ukrainian people, um, I think, you know, that there is a, a move. And I think to, to basically go much further and, and much faster to, to get the job done. I think an understanding of what it is going to take is really important. And I think that understanding has been far too slow. And, um, you know, this has been a cold war, a frozen conflict right back from 2014. We're in the ninth year of this. Uh, you know, I know it, the hot war started uh, back in um, back in 2022, but actually the invasion of Crimea happened in 2014. And the lesson with Putin is the only thing he understands is force. There's no negotiating with him. I hereby nominate you as Defence Secretary in the next Labour government. Thank you so much. Thank you. John Healy's doing a very good In job. fact, just on that, mm -hmm. uh, Orla in Barnet says, can you ask Mary if she would ever become an MP again? She was fab and we need her back on the benches. Oh, thanks, Orla. Um, well, um... Let's just say, yes, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> right, Tim, I'm Sta considering my Tim Stanley. The voters I have no immediate plans, always means I'm planning for it. <laughs> um, I, I've sat in on a number of Defence Committee meetings about this because I, I wanted to understand the issue myself. Um, and the... Uh, there is an argument for saying just give them the jets, give them the jets, partly because uh, the, uh, the theory is that that will then open it up for other material to be delivered. So in the past, Britain has given stuff to Ukraine, which wasn't necessarily terribly useful, but it began internationally a drive towards the supply of, of other things. The argument against it is that the, the exact kind of jets that we have... Uh, might not be appropriate for the Ukrainian situation. Plus, what people don't necessarily appreciate is there are other issues around supply um, that we're running low on yeah. our own. Yeah. Um, uh, some of our stock may be a bit out of date. Uh, it has to be fully maintained, as Mary just said. And you don't just supply the jet and someone jumps in the cockpit and flies off in it. Of course, you have to have engineers, you have to have ground staff, and it takes some time to train people. So the question is, is it really, um, is it really the right thing that Ukraine needs right now? But if they... The answer is yes, because until they get control of the skies, Russia is going to keep sending hundreds of missiles and attacks yeah. on civilians every single day of the but week. If, so if, there's no question to that. If they want MiGs or F-16s, there are plenty of countries in the world with those planes, which yeah. surely, if we encourage them to supply them, then we could back supply maybe 
some, something else. We, have, I, I we don't also know. have to ask the question, like, how much are we, how close are we willing to go to the point in a finite stock of what Britain's got to where Britain itself now starts to look vulnerable? I mean, all right, we're not in a conflict situation really right now, so we can possibly share it. But our, our defence stock is already pretty stretched. And there is a bigger conversation that I think is going to start to develop here, but more pronouncedly in the US about how much the West is given and how giving and how long it's willing to go on doing it. This is our war, Tim. I don't think there's any get-out-of-jail-free card on this. Polly? I mean, on the, the technicalities of it, I don't think I've got anything to add to what Mary um, and, and Tim have said. The question for me is how do we continue to sustain that political momentum? You know, we see uh, an increasing number of figures in the US um, and, and, and some kind of uh, thought leaders in the UK starting to starting to doubt, starting to place impossible kind of challenges on Zelensky. Like, what if what if he wins too much? What if he's too forceful and that aggravates Putin? What if uh, he uh, doesn't have enough of an impact and that encourages Putin to, to, to drive forward? I think, as Mary says, this in the end is is our war by appeasing Putin for uh, so long over over Crimea, over um, some of those oh, earlier yes. incursions into Ukraine. We have we have brought this to happen, um, but we have to expect that we are in this for a long fight. And so thinking long term about how we build up our military strength, our, our military investment uh, remains, you know, something on which, uh, you know, actually lots of those uh, conservative thinkers we were talking about earlier uh, are in the right, um, in my view. Matt? I was there for Zelensky's address in, in Westminster Hall to Parliament, and, and that sort of rallying cry, that incredible give us wings for freedom when he presented um, a fighter pilot's helmet to the speaker, no one who was there, and of course Rishi was there, of course the, the, the whole of Parliament was there, no one could resist uh, that rallying cry. So this decision that we've taken today about drones, about other uh, equipment, uh, that is fundamentally because, as Mary said, as Tim has said, um, we don't we don't have the thing that will do them uh, the most benefit. But what we do want to do, I think, is do everything possible to try and undo the damage of, of fundamentally mistakes that were made in how we treated uh, the uh, Crimea uh, invasion and subsequently how we've allowed Putin to get to a point uh, that is bad not just for Ukraine but bad for the whole of Europe and the wider world. So I think there is a huge amount of uh, goodwill. You've seen that from, from Rishi Sunak today. I think there's more to come. I think uh, let's not get uh, completely sidetracked into one conversation about F-16s. The principle about how can we do everything we possibly can to help Ukraine is one that's fundamentally embedded in Downing Street and is going to continue to be. Right, well, let's go to our final question. It's from Don in Preston. We have a little bit more time for this than we normally do. Uh, more speculation in the papers today about who should be the next James Bond. The latest rumour is Aaron Taylor Johnson of Kickass fame. Panel, you can pick, can you pick the next James Bond? But it must be a public figure who you've actually met in person. We've got some quite a few suggestions from our listeners coming into this. Um, Matt Warman. Well, how could it not be Ian Dale, Ian? I mean, that's the yeah. only that's the only suggestion. Um, so, in, in a former life, I used to uh, write about television, so I got to interview quite a few uh, fun people. Uh, people like Dominic West, I think, would be great, but that's far too serious a suggestion for this kind of Didn't he play uh, Prince Charles in the crowd? Debate. Exactly. Well, I mean, why, uh, someone else actually, I, I think, has already suggested uh, the then Prince Charles himself. So uh, there are so many w ways we could go uh, with this. But but I do think uh, I hope this question is going to produce more amusement than serious answers because the act next James Bond is much less interesting than who it would be hilarious to see playing him. Well, Nicky and Kent has got a suggestion. Our very own James O'Brien. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, if I was to pick an LBC presenter, I think I'd pick Andrew Castle. I think he's got that sort of suave. He's got vibes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mary? Ross Kemp. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, he came oh, to support me in my uh, general election campaign. And That's the criteria, is it? I think... <laughs> <laughs> that worked well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, John, John that Redwood wasn't his fault. Me, um, I liked that very much. No, Ross Kemp, I think he's got quite, quite a hard... You've gone positively dreamy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was between him and John Barnes who gave me a big hug at an anti-Brexit rally. So, you know, I, if we can, if they can do a job share, I think they'd both be good. Okay. John Barnes is the suave, sophisticated one. Ross Kemp would do a bit more of the action stuff. Polly. 
Well, one of your callers suggested uh, Johnny Mercer, the the MP, and certainly he's probably the most ripped person I've short. kind of met. Too short, but like he, you can see his muscles trying to get out of his shirt if he takes. I mean, he's slight, but he's not my pick. Never trust a man I who wears a tight shirt. I want to annoy the listeners as much as I did suggesting votes for babies, three-year-old so, and babies. Um, <laughs> I'm going to suggest uh, a well-known ceramicist and uh, <laughs> Grayson Perry, known for his oh flamboyant uh, clothing style, also Chancellor of University of the Could Arts, he handle the London. Oh, he'd pardon. be amazing with the weapons, and he would carry it off in enormous style. Like, we totally need a gay bond. Not that Grayson Perry is, in fact, gay, but, like, the... <laughs> <laughs> I was meaning, like... That sort of dig yourself out of that one. I'm dig myself anyway, out of that one. Anyway, talking, of, talking amazing, of a gay bond, Tim Stanley. What? <laughs> I think uh, I think it has to be uh, Jacob Rees Mogg. <laughs> he <laughs> he has the he has that suave elan. He has a way with words. Uh, he has though. the he has the clothes. I mean, you wouldn't need to do much with the wardrobe. And I would I just want to see the sex scenes. I want to see how he handles. Oh that. God! No. Oh, no. <laughs> said, said <laughs> no one ever. <laughs> Right, here's some suggestions from our listeners. Marnie in Glastonbury says Julian Anderson. Yes, please. Uh, somebody else, Tom Hardy. Uh, well, you, you, there is a rumour that it's it might a be a woman. It's character, right? Um, I suggested Amelia Fox. Erin Doherty, who, who plays Princess Anne in The Crown. Yeah. Imagine yeah. a gay girl bond. Catherine says Johnny Mercer. Tony from Stain says George <gasps> Galloway. Uh, Mackenzie in Northampton says Boris Johnson. Oh, no. And John says Rishi Sunak will save MI5 and us all. On that Amen. note, thank you to our panel. Um, an extraordinary edition of Cross. <laughs> I think you can. Better or worse. I think you can say that very safely. Right, coming up in the next hour, thank you to all of our panel, by the way. Uh, coming up in the next hour, we're going to be joined by Ruby Wax, who I have to say, I've always wanted to meet, so I'm very excited. I'm going to try not to do too much fanboying, um, but she's got a new book out called I'm Not As Well As I Thought I Was. Now, m most of you will know Ruby Wax as a comedian, but she's also a really brilliant mental health campaigner. She's been through a lot of trials and tribulations herself in this area. She's going to take your calls, and I hope you've got some really good questions to put to her over the next hour. It is Mental Health Awareness Week. That's why we're doing this hour. Uh, really encourage you to phone in 0345 6060 973. You'll also be able to watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, Russia is criticising the UK's decision to give more missiles and drones to Ukraine, saying it takes a negative view of the move. President Volodymyr Zelensky has been meeting the Prime Minister at Chequers as part of his short tour of Europe, which has also included Germany and France. The chair of the House of Commons Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, has told LBC the UK is doing the right thing. They need that um, high-tech military equipment from the West, Britain has got a very, very tr good track record here. We were the first to step forward with those anti-tank weapons, then with the main battle tanks, long-range missiles, and now attack drones. The piece that's missing there are the fast jets, because they're the ones that give the tanks the top cover. Also this evening, the White House is claiming Russia is 